Right now, a community reeling from tragedy in the middle of a massive search to find a man accused of killing 18 people in a small town in Maine. Schools and businesses are closed as local authorities tell police people living in the area shelter in place while they look for that suspect. We are on the ground with the latest. Israel launching a rare targeted ground raid into northern Gaza as the military says it's getting ready for the next stages of the war. New video put that raid looked like. Then the FTX founder takes the stand as we are on the air, but not in front of a jury. Why a judge wants to hear his testimony privately first. And in tonight's original, you've probably seen a lot of posts online about the war between Israel and Hamas. But Arabs in Israel, Is Arabs, say for them, speaking out is not easy. Why they're worried that if they post, that could lead to jail time. Plus, a surprisingly gangbusters quarter for the U.S. economy. I mean, it was on fire. Consumers feeling good about spending, but it may not last long. It may not be good for the housing market. We're going to explain all of that. Top of the hour to you. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson. And right now, that massive manhunt still underway for the suspect accused of killing at least 18 people in the small main town of Lewiston. Locals forced to run in terror from the scene last night as the shooting unfolded, desperate to get away from the gunfire. People in Lewiston in total disbelief, especially the families of those victims. The father of a man who worked at a local bar where at least eight people were killed, he tells our Lester Holt his son died a hero. Joey Walker was shot to death at Shemingi's. Shot to death, but she, then he went into telling her that uh, he died as a hero because he picked up a, a butcher knife from somewhere as, you know, they, he has all that stuff near the bar anyways. And he tried to go at the gunman to stop him from shooting anybody else. The gunman shot him twice, twice through this. Did it change your pain at all, oh. knowing that? It made it worse. Yeah, it made it worse. Mm. You can see more of Lester's interview on NBC Nightly News tonight. Police are looking for this man, 40-year-old Army Reservist Robert Card. They say that's him in these images carrying a rifle. Here's what we know about him right now and about the killings. 18 are dead and at least 16 are hurt some are in critical condition. Card, the suspect, still on the run as police cast a very wide dragnet over the region. There are two shooting scenes, one at a bowling alley, one at a local bar less than five miles apart from each other. NBC News can also confirm that the gun used in the shooting was obtained legally. And we also now know that the suspect was sent by his own military commanders to receive psychi psychiatric treatment over the summer. Right now, Lewiston and the neighboring town of Auburn still on lockdown, and there are a lot of questions still outstanding. Most importantly, where is the suspect right now? No indication from police that they're closing in on him right now. Yet, also unclear, the motivation behind all of this. Why the suspect decided to unleash this level of carnage on people enjoying a night out bowling or having a beer. We also don't know the vast majority of the names of the identities of the victims, with some families questioning whether their loved ones are dead or alive. We want to bring in our team right now covering the situation in Lewiston, Maine, NBC's Rahema Ellis and also Antonia Hilton on the ground. Rahema, can we start with you? What can you tell us right now about the status of this manhunt? We're approaching almost 24 hours, right? Indeed, we are. And I can tell you that law enforcement authorities tell us that they've got agencies from local, state, and federal offices who are here, hundreds of law enforcement officers here, trying to find the suspect. We can also tell you that, according to senior law enforcement officials, they've told NBC News that they found a note at the suspect's home. The nature of the note, where it was found, what's contained in that note, we do not know. But the hope in this community is, is that it provides some clues to law enforcement that may help them understand why the suspect reigned the kind of terror on this community that he did almost 24 hours ago. The governor says they're not going to rest until they figure this out. Take a listen. This city did not deserve this terrible assault on its citizens, on its peace of mind, <clears throat> on its sense of security. 
We cannot and we will not rest in this endeavor. And one of the things that they're doing is that shelter in place um, order not only is extending, but it's widening. Take a look at the places where the shelter in place order is. And you notice that the certain counties and the towns of Bowdoin, Lisbon, and of course, Lewiston are named on here. It's an eerie thing when you drive down the street, businesses closed, schools closed, et cetera, and a sign that says shelter in place. If that doesn't make you fearful, not much else will. Tom? Absolutely. Uh, the suspect, 40-year-old Robert Card, and the police seemed to know pretty quickly who they were looking for, right? Yeah, they did, because when he went into the bowling alley uh, and to the bar that's only four miles from here, he wasn't wearing a mask. He wasn't wearing body armor. So they were able to get a pretty clear picture of who this was. We've got some image, some, some notes of who this person is. Take a look at this. They're saying that he is an Army Reservist since 2002, trained firearms instructor, decorated with several medals and ribbons, reportedly had recent mental health issues, hearing voices and threatening to shoot up the National Guard base. We are also hearing that his family alerted those at the national at with uh, with the reservists that they were concerned about him and that was one of the reasons that they led him into that mental health facility for checkup for a couple of weeks during the summer but uh, still they are looking for him now Tom and his gun was obtained legally uh, what do we know well Lewiston is such a small quiet town one of my neighbor's kids went to school there what do we know about how the town is reacting and the and the access to weapons like this, I mean, this is really kind of an, uh, just a horrific situation for that small town. It absolutely is. The state of Maine, there are 1.3 million people in the whole state of Maine. There are more trees than people here, for sure. And this is a this is a gun friendly town. When you start to look at the rankings of where this uh, city and the state ranks in terms of gun laws, take a look at this. Uh, Maine is ranked 25th in the country for gun law strength. There are no background checks on all gun sales, no red flag laws, no ban on high capacity magazines, and no permit required for concealed carry. It's interesting that many people said that t last night and probably tonight as well, they had their weapons at home and they were ready, they were prepared for what might come. Thankfully, it didn't happen. There were no other reports of any firearms uh, being used, but they were prepared. People here have a lot of guns. Tom? Yep, and the suspect's still on the loose. Uh, Rahema, thank you very much. We want to go now to NBC's Antonia Hilton. Uh, Antonia, as I mentioned, uh, this is a small, quiet college town, fewer than 40,000 people in, the st and in a state where we know that there were fewer murders in all of 2021 than there were just yesterday. The whole region must just be in disbelief. In disbelief? In shock, this has been excruciating, Tom. You know, one person described it to me as, you know, this kind of thing just doesn't happen here. It's tight knit. People know each other. They know many of the victims, and they they hang out at these locations. Uh, some people that I've spoken to today, they grew up here their entire lives. They came back here. They have kids or or grandkids or nieces and nephews here, and so to see this kind of violence happen in a place that has been a, place of comfort and so familiar to them is deeply painful. Our colleague George Solis actually spent time talking to one woman who has two family members who are still missing. You know, you spoke about this a bit earlier, but of the 18 people who we know have died, who were killed, 10 have not yet been identified. That means that there's at least 10 families waiting for more information. And as the hours tick by, what we're hearing is that it's become more and more painful and they're fearing the worst. Take a listen to this conversation that George had. They're just innocent people, just innocent people out for a night of bowling. This was a children's event. This is just devastating. This is just devastating. You know, we're not if we if we knew something, but we don't know anything. We're coming up blank. Where are they? Community members say that it was youth night at that bowling alley, and so the, while we haven't heard clarity from officials about how many minors are among the dead, 
The sense from the community is that we are going to find out about some of them soon. And that has added a new layer of heartbreak. One woman told me that she was here at the medical center behind me where three people are still in critical condition, Tom. And she watched as some young people were brought in here uh, just minutes after 7 p.m. after this horrible violence happened. Uh, and it has really rocked this community. I think Rahema used the word eerie. That is the feeling here on the ground. School is closed tomorrow. Businesses will still be closed here as people really hold their breath and hope that they wake up tomorrow to the news that they have found more developments and possibly found rubber card. Let's hope so. Uh, Antonia Hilton, thank you very much. Now, there's still a whole lot we don't know, but we are starting to get a clearer picture of the sequence of events. NBC's Noel Pransky breaks down the timeline for us. Another American town forever changed. Out of nowhere, he just came in and there was a loud pop. He was holding a weapon. I just booked it. Maine State Police say Wednesday night at 6.56 p.m., officials got a 911 call about a gunman opening fire at Just In Time Recreation, a bowling alley in Lewiston. Then at 7.08, 12 minutes later, 911 calls came in reporting another shooting, this one at a bar and grill about four miles away. Multiple victims for an active shooter in the town of Lewiston. It was only 16 minutes after that when a local hospital says the first patient arrived. It admitted 14 more over the next 45 minutes. A little bit after 8, the county sheriff's office released these photos of the alleged shooter as Lewiston issued a shelter-in-place order. And at 8.30, officials in Auburn nearby did the same. About an hour after that, state police say Lewiston got a call identifying a person of interest. Here's a public safety official later that night. And police are currently searching for a Robert R. Card, 44 of 1983 of Bowden. Card is considered armed and dangerous. Around 10 p.m., a neighboring police department told Lewiston police they found this car belonging to Card, but he wasn't in it. And at midnight, Maine State Police extended its shelter in place order to nearby Lisbon, then to Bowden the next morning, and later encompassing two full counties. Classes were canceled the next day at Lewiston and at Bates College and more than 200 other schools in the area. And at a news briefing at 10.30 a.m., officials said they issued an arrest warrant, initially charging Card with eight counts of murder. This is a dark day for Maine. With hundreds of officers here and beyond searching for Card, Maine reels and remembers. It's hard for us to think about healing when our hearts are broken. But I want every person in Maine to know that we will heal together. Noah Pransky, NBC News. Let's bring in now Adelaide Addy, rather, Lanu and Zoe Ash, both sophomores at nearby Bates College in the town of Lewiston. Uh, ladies, I can only imagine that you probably have been through a very terrifying 20 hours or so. I know that's a beautiful, picturesque campus. Talk about the moment you realized something in town was really going in wrong. Something was bad. Yeah, um, I was just eating dinner with my friends, um, and people started to whisper that something was happening. There were rumors. I didn't know if any of it was real or what was really happening. Um, but my gut told me to just go home. So I went from the dining hall back to my dorm immediately. Um, and by that time, I started to get texts from people and started to look at the news and realize that this was a real thing that was happening. And that's when it started to feel very real and scary. Uh, the suspect's still on the run, and your school is on lockdown. I understand the campus is, is virtually deserted and residents told to shelter in place. Are students feeling on edge, nervous? Are you able to go out and get food, for example, at the dining hall? Yeah, so this morning we didn't really know what was happening with food or anything like that. Um, but luckily, campus has been sending us uh, updates every hour, every couple hours or so. Uh, and we finally got to go get food um, for my dorm around about 2 p.m. Um, it was chaos in the dining hall, honestly. I don't think anyone really knows what to do with themselves right now. It's, it's just chaos. Does the school seem to be handling it well? Of course, this is unprecedented for, for almost any university, but they're under a lot of stress. Are they handling it well, and, and how are you all feeling? I think the response um, started out kind of slow. I remember that um, a lot of people were talking about it before we got any sort of official notification, 
But I also understand why that's the case when, you know, reporting something like this falsely could cause a lot of panic and for the situation to spiral out of control even more rapidly. And I think that once um, emails started coming out, they were generally pretty informative and uh, told us a lot about what was the safest course of action to take. Well, Addie and Zoe, we certainly wish you well. Uh, please stay safe. And, um, and uh, it obviously, we'll be watching and waiting for any developments. Thank you, ladies. And we continue to monitor the situation. A news conference planned at the top of the hour. We'll have that to you as soon as it comes in. To the Middle East now and where just hours ago the Israeli military carried out a rare targeted ground raid into northern Gaza. Take a look at this. The IDF putting out video of tanks and special forces actually inside Gaza before then pulling back from that area. Israel says the operation is part of a, quote, preparation for the next stage of combat in what could be a precursor to the widely expected ground invasion of Gaza. The big questions now include what would that look like and when could it actually happen? It comes as we're just learning the U.S. is now deploying 900 troops to the Middle East amid all the rising tension. All of this as the number of people killed in the war continues to grow. At least 7,000 people are now dead in Gaza. That according to Palestinian health officials. NBC's Hala Gorani is on the ground in Tel Aviv. Uh, give us a sense of what's happening there. And to be clear, this is not the ground invasion that Israel had promised. Rather, we have been watching this targeted raid by the IDF into Gaza, right? Correct. And it was a pretty shallow raid. It was about half a mile. It was designed, according to the Israeli military, uh, as uh, uh, an operation to target some anti-tank missile launch pads. And it was part of the preparations for that widely anticipated uh, a ground offensive and ground assault. But these are, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Israeli military handouts that show the movement of these tanks inside the Gaza Strip. They didn't spend much time there. Um, this is uh, after a slightly more limited ground incursion that happened a few days ago. This is the biggest one yet, but still very, very far off from what we expect and what's been promised and announced by the Israeli government, and that is an all-out ground assault. We understand this would be to sort of prepare the terrain for a ground invasion, including ground troops. Now, this is all coming against the backdrop of, of, of just absolutely a, a tremendous need on the humanitarian side from ordinary Gazans. Uh, 12 more trucks made it into the Gaza Strip through the Rafah border crossing from Egypt into Gaza, carrying medicine and water, but no fuel. And this is something that aid agencies and the UN relief agency on the ground are telling us has become as urgent as water and food itself, because uh, they need the fuel in order to power vehicles to distribute essential supplies to those in need. Tom. And how, uh, Hamas is responding, I understand, by calling for worldwide protests to stop what it is calling this war of extermination, its words. Walk us through what Hamas is saying. Well, so they are calling for worldwide protests. They're calling for the Arab street to rise up, to demand an end to the Israeli offensive on Gaza. And you have to remember that tomorrow, Friday, is the day of, uh, of uh, Muslim prayer. And oftentimes you see protests after prayers on Fridays, midday usually, and, th and that's where we might see them in the West Bank tomorrow. We might see them in other Arab capitals and across the region. And we have actually, in fact, seen uh, protests in some Western capital capitals as well. Now, now, Hamas is waging, just as any other party in a war, a PR battle here with these types of announcements and calls for protests. So we'll see every Friday, of course, as journalists, we keep a very close eye on what happens after these Friday prayers and, and how these protests unfold, Tom. Veteran correspondent Hala Garani on the ground. Thank you so much. The Israeli military is saying 224 families have now been notified that their loved ones are being held hostages by Hamas. That raises the total number of people in Hamas captivity. High-level negotiations are taking place on the world stage to get more of those hostages out. NBC's Matt Bradley has more from southern Lebanon. Yeah, well, just today, the Israeli Defense Forces announced that they had identified the families of those 224 captives who Hamas took from southern Israel during their terrorist operation that shot the world on October 7th. Now, 
so far, four of those have been returned. And actually, those four were not included in that 224 number. All of them were sent over the Rafah border crossing and into Egypt. And in fact, we heard from one of them recently describing her or ordeal and describing where a lot of these hostages are. They're in a huge warren of tunnels underneath the Gaza Strip. And this has made things very difficult as Israel continues to bombard the Gaza Strip with thousands of bombs, they have just said. And meanwhile, they're mustering their forces, planning an enormous ground invasion into the Gaza Strip. This is a much anticipated attack that the Israelis have projected will completely dismantle Hamas. So all of this is complicated, while at the same time, there are negotiations that are going on with Hamas, mostly through the Qataris. And we just heard our partners at Sky News interviewed one of the lead negotiators who said that Hamas would be willing to free all of these civilian captives if Israel were to pause their fighting, pause their bombardments, and I suppose pause their planned invasion of the Gaza Strip. Now, that is something that doesn't seem to be necessarily something that we've heard the Israelis taking on to. This is an operation that the Israeli public, the Israeli military has been preparing for for weeks, and they seem to be very interested in executing it and finally putting an end to their antagonists in the Gaza Strip, Hamas. But that could imperil, again, these hundreds of Israelis who are being held under this barricaded enclave. All right, Matt Bradley on the ground in Lebanon for us. Thank you. Uh, also, tell you, we want to tell you to catch a Hallie Jackson Now special report, taking a step back to look at some of the biggest questions coming out of this Israel-Hamas war. It's tomorrow night, 11 o'clock Eastern time. You can tune in at so many places, including Peacock, Roku, Pluto TV, Tubi, Hulu, or our NBC News YouTube channel. Switching gears now, we're getting our first look at the destruction caused by that record-setting Category 5 hurricane that slammed the popular Mexico resort town of Acapulco seemingly out of nowhere. We're learning tonight that the storm killed at least 27 people. Take a look at the streets there, underwater, submerged, and dramatically a stadium basically turned into an island amid all that water. Entire floors of one building look entirely blown out. The town is literally turned upside down. Tonight, people say they're shocked by how this happened so quickly and surprised that they even survived. What is this? We are alive. I don't know how we are alive, but we are alive. Well, the hurricane came on shortly uh, and on shore very soon, I should say, uh, early Wednesday morning after experts say it explosively intensified, uh, catching everybody off guard. It's now the strongest storm to hit Mexico's Pacific coast ever. We're going to bring in NBC's Guad Venegas. Communication still not entirely back up, Guad, I understand, in Acapulco. So what's the latest in the efforts to get everything cleaned up there and get help to those folks? Tom, according to the Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, the priority right now is to restore power to all of Acapulco. Uh, the president visited the area yesterday. He said it looked like nearly every utility pole in the city of Acapulco had been knocked over by the storm. And you can see the extensive damage. Now, Tom, a lot of these videos that we're seeing are in the nicer areas of Acapulco. Some of these are four and five star hotels in the tourist area, the downtown area uh, next to the beach. We can see hotels that are almost destroyed, shopping centers, stores that practically have nothing but walls. The windows, the doors have all been uh, blown out and debris all over the streets. The airport in the city has been damaged. Uh, the terminal has been damaged. The control tower as well. So there is extensive damage everywhere uh, in the city of Acapulco. Local authorities are still assessing some of that damage. And the first report they gave, as you mentioned, was that 27 people died and there were four missing. Those four missing uh, were members of the military. These were first responders. And the president also said later, after they reported those numbers, that one of those four is believed to have also uh, died. And there's also a lot of work to be done with the highway. There's one main highway that connects the city of Acapulco with the rest of the country, including Mexico City, which is essential, Tom, because this is the highway that is going to be used or is being used to get all of the help in. Right now, it's partially open with one lane going towards Acapulco and one lane towards Mexico City. Yeah, I've been on that highway. It's been a number of years, but it's critical. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of looting happening in the malls and the grocery stores. What are police and city leaders saying about that? Well, Tom, this morning, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador 
ask people not to loot. Uh, he understands that a lot of people lost everything. They lost their homes. And many of them were breaking into these stores to take perishable items. In fact, in some of these images, you can see members of the National Guard allowing people to walk out of the stores because many of them were taking food. Some of those individuals uh, talked to the cameras and said, we are taking food. But as you can see in these images, others did take televisions, appliances. At some point, we saw somebody taking a couch and taking items that they should not be taking. So there is looting that's taking place that should not, while others are trying to take food. The president is asking people not to do this, saying that the help is coming in uh, from Mexico City, Tom. All right, Guad, thank you very much. Guad Venegas, watching it all. Coming up from us, a rare move in FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed's fraud trial today. You're going to want to listen to this. It's really odd. Plus, what happened when a deer suddenly charged into a Wisconsin restaurant during lunchtime? Yeah, that'll, that'll shake things up. That's coming up later in our, later in our five things. Okay, Beatles fans, listen up. The latest Beatles song is new and old. Yeah, the latest Beatles song. What helped make now and then happen and how you can hear it coming up in just a few minutes. First of all, from us, happening late today, Sam Bankman fried appearing before a judge ahead of his expected testimony in his own defense tomorrow. It's a rare move here. The judge decided to hold a hearing with Bankman fried first without the jury there. He will then decide what evidence the jury can hear. Now, SBF tell the, told the juryless courtroom that his crypto company, FTX, was subject to constant hacking attacks and that lawyers for the company were in charge of moving money between companies associated with FTX, opening bank accounts for customers and deciding when they could delete company data. CNBC's Kate Rooney is watching all of this for us. Kate, you've been following this closely throughout. Bring us up to speed on what happened in court today and what we can expect tomorrow. So, Tom, interesting that the jury was not in the room. This was sort of a hearing within a hearing. It was about what's admissible, what can they present to the jury. And a lot of it was about shifting blame to the lawyers, the FTX lawyers. At the time, Bankman Freed and his legal team really tried to, to place the blame on them. You noticed a stark difference, though. His defense team was questioning Bankman Freed. It was very yes or no answers. He seemed calm and collected. When the cross-examination started, so this is the prosecution, the government side, he seemed completely scrambled. He was delaying. He was sipping his water bottle and trying to, to kind of delay questions, reroute different questions. A lot of frustration from the judge as well, saying, answer the question. He would kind of go on these tangents. There were a few examples. Instead of just saying yes or no, he'd say, that's not quite how I remember it, or kind of go on these really roundabout ways of answering, which caused a lot of frustration from the prosecution and the judge. So that's something I would expect in the coming days and weeks as he continues that cross-examination, sort of this ability to kind of shift the question, which is really frustrating, at least to the judge that we saw today. Yeah, you know, historically, when white-collar defendants are convicted, it happens when they take the stand. Uh, and SBF is starting to make his, his case there on the stand. But then it's the prosecution's turn to poke holes in that story. What are they likely to focus on? So they are likely to focus on what Sam Bankman Freed knew. You're right, though. It is not the move that defense lawyers typically recommend is getting up there. He's very much exposed. And we started to see that coming together today, that the defense would hold him accountable and say, OK, you said this, but let me show you a document that says the complete opposite. And that's really where Sam Bankman Freed stumbled. When he was faced with direct documentation, he had the terms of service for the FTX customer agreements, for example, and they said, Hey, we've got to write. You did know about it. Hey, look at this document. And that's really where you saw things fall apart. You would think that a jury, though, is going to be looking at that. They're really testing his credibility. Do they believe him on the stand after hearing some of his closest allies in inner circle over the past few weeks who have testified and giving real, really damaging testimony against him, saying, yes, we committed crimes. And by the way, Sam Beckman fried told us to commit those crimes. So mm. He has very much an uphill battle for the rest of this case here. So really quick, fast question, did he appear competent to you, competent to stand trial and, and make his own case? Not when I just walked out of the courtroom. He did in the beginning when he had his defense team question. He was very confident going through the list of questions. He did not seem as confident when he was being cross-examined, stuttering, kind of sipping a bottle of water to try to delay questions. So he, he was a little bit all over the place and a really marked difference. So I would not call that confident. 
Got it. Kate Rooney, thank you very much. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks that you might want to know about tonight. Number one, a week-long manhunt for a man accused of shooting and killing a judge in Maryland ended today when the suspect was found dead. Just hours before the judge was killed, he had ruled against Pedro Argote in a child custody fight with Argote's estranged wife. Police say they found Argote's body in a heavily wooded area today. They're still investigating exactly how he died. Number two, food insecurity in the United States went up big time last year compared to 2021. That according to a new report from the Department of Agriculture. We're talking some 17 million households that they say struggle to get enough food. Experts are blaming high inflation on the end of pandemic era government relief in 2022. Number three, New York's Museum of Natural History says it's pulling all human remains from its displays. Why? The museum's president says for the most part, the remains in their collection were taken without the consent, the clear consent of the dead or their descendants. The goal now is to figure out what the museum should do and whether they should return them and to whom and to properly take care of any remains that stay behind. Number four, take a look at this. People at this Wisconsin restaurant did not quite know what was happening when this wasn't supposed to happen. A deer came crashing through a window during lunchtime. He was a little hungry. Nobody hurt. And the restaurant is now offering a two buck, sorry, two buck mac and cheese special on Wednesday to commemorate the incident. He's got horns, he's a buck. Number five, AI is giving Beatles fans, Beatles fans rather, uh, one last new song from the band. Now and Then comes from a batch of unreleased demos written by John Lennon. Then's other members also worked on the song, but there were some technical issues that didn't quite allow for the track to be completed until now. The song will be out next week, along with a 12 minute movie telling the story of the new recording. Gotta watch that. When we come back, the suspect in the Idaho College murders is back in court, and his push to have the case thrown out today just failed. What's next in this trial after a break? Something or somebody is tearing up a golf course in Arizona, and the super hot summer may be to blame. We're going to explain when we come back. That's going to be on the local. Just moments ago, an Idaho judge denied a motion to dismiss the case for the suspect charged in the murder of four University of Idaho students. Now, that came at the end of the suspect's second hearing of the day. The suspect's lawyers are trying two different arguments to try to get the case tossed out. Remember, Brian Koberger was indicted by a grand jury in May for the murder of four University of Idaho students. He pleaded not guilty. They were found dead in their off-campus home last November. We want to remind you of their names and their faces as we bring in NBC's Dana Griffin, who is covering the latest developments. Dana, uh, the motion to dismiss just denied. The first hearing was closed and sealed so we don't know much about those arguments, right? But the second hearing was open. Yeah. What was the deciding factor there? Yeah, so during the open hearing, the defense argued to throw out the grand jury indictment, saying that the jury was misled on the standard of proof required for an indictment during those jury instructions. The defense says that that standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, the state argued sufficient probable cause is the correct standard of proof for a grand jury. Now, this stems from the defense saying that there were six jurors who wanted more evidence before they made their decision. And because the state said, oh, you only have to determine probable cause, they felt that that swayed their decision. The judge denied the motion and says that this is something that needs to go to the Idaho Supreme Court, which the defense is likely to do, which, Tom, this could likely delay a potential start date for a trial, which has yet to be set. Well, OK, you just answered my question. My next question, where does this go from here? And it sounds like we may have a series of delays then. Possibly. And legal experts say that this attempt by the defense to get the case dismissed is fairly routine. And as proven, it was unlikely that this case or that this indictment was going to be overturned. Remember, right. Kohlberger has waived his right to a speedy trial. A trial date has not been set, but it could begin sometime next year. Kohlberger is facing four counts of first degree murder and one count of felony burglary. A plea of not guilty was filed on Kohlberger's behalf by the judge, and the state is seeking the death 
death penalty. And Tom, we did get some clarity on another issue that has surrounded this trial over cameras in the courtroom. The judge said today that he will not ban cameras in the courtroom, but says that he needs to take more control over those mm -hmm. cameras and what they record, because he said he's been disappointed by some things that he's seen uh, as far as some of these images being used um, in ways that he did not find favorable. And he really wants to make sure that this is a fair trial. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see when the trial date is set and how much more of a delay we could see. Tom. Let's remind the audience that prosecutors presented what many legal anal analysts say was pretty compelling evidence of his responsibility in the murders. Dana, thank you very much. Very true. Uh, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because it's tough to read, to watch, or listen to everything, our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. So this is what they tell us is going down in their regions. We call the segment The Local from our Western Bureau. 35 years after getting fertility treatment, a woman in Wisconsin uh, is suing, or rather accusing, I should say, a Washington state doctor of secretly using his own sperm to get her pregnant. That according to that lawsuit filed today. Now the Seattle Times reports, the woman's daughter found out that she had several half siblings on an online geological site. She says the doctor's profile was also on the site and the DNA results matched. We reached out to both parties for comment and we have not heard back. Also from our Western Bureau, a golf course in Arizona is dealing with a big problem. That guy right there, look at this. Herds of javelinas, which resemble wild boar, tearing up massive parts of the course. It turns out hot temperatures this summer may have been to blame. It's not the first time that this has happened. The club is working with wildlife experts to figure out exactly how to coexist with these hungry hogs. From our Southern Bureau, the first ever Florida Man Games. Florida Man Games coming to St. Augustine next year. Organizers are calling it the most insane athletic showdown on earth. And they say it's all meant to poke fun at the state's reputation for producing weird news stories, including this boy will include rather. Listen to this uh, beer belly wrestling, uh, a cash grab and event and also an evading arrest obstacle course. It just sounds like a, an episode of Cops to me. All right, coming up, the U.S. economy was on fire last quarter, growing much faster than expected, even though inflation and interest rates are still very high. So how long does this last? Plus, what it's been like for Arabs living in Israel since the war with Hamas started. That's coming up in our original report tonight. Stay with us. Quarter till the hour, we want to bring you now today's original, which is in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And you're probably seeing tons of posts on social media about the Israel-Hamas war from people in the U.S. and around the world. But some Arab citizens of Israel, Arab citizens of Israel, who make up about 20 percent of the population there, they say that they're scared to post because it can have a major blowback effect. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. The Israeli city of Ramla, Arabs and Jews have been living, working, and raising families on the same land for centuries. Yusuf El Shamli, a grandfather and one of Israel's Arab citizens, says his family has been here for 80 years. But these days, Yusuf fears if he says one word about the suffering of Arabs in Gaza, the Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, will arrest him. I ask him how it feels to be an Arab in Israel during a war. He says, we Arabs in Israel are like a divorced couple. The kids don't know where to go, to mom or to dad. We're in the middle. Since the Israel-Gaza war started, human rights groups say hundreds of Arabs have been fired, suspended from universities, or even arrested, accused of supporting terror or sympathizing with Hamas, mostly on social media. Israel's police chief has declared zero tolerance for inciting violence and pro-Hamas protests. Saying on TikTok, anyone who wants to identify with Gaza, go ahead. I'll put them on buses and send them there. And the president of Tel Aviv University has vowed to be very strict with students who support Hamas. Writing, when we feel the offense is criminal in nature, we shall report them to the police. Hassan Jabarin runs Adala, an Arab human rights group representing 80 students who have been suspended or expelled. We are trying to explain that this people have the right of freedom of expression to express their anger against the war and to criticize Israel, but has nothing to do with supporting violence against Israelis.
Amir, not his real name, was threatened with disciplinary proceedings after a social media post suggesting the historical oppression of Palestinians had led to the Israel-Gaza war. And what was the response to that post? Well, uh, the response was people accusing me of justifying terrorism. The university has sent me an email basically saying that they have reason to believe that I am supporting the actions of a certain side over the other. The side of Hamas, whose terror attacks killed more than 1,400 people and triggered an Israeli response that many Arab citizens say includes an unprecedented crackdown on free speech. Amir, who says he opposes violence against civilians, requested anonymity because he says he's concerned about even more retaliation for speaking out about what happened. How risky is it for you to be speaking out right now? I mean, everyone is terrified. Other Arab students have reported being doxxed, their home addresses posted on social media. And popular Palestinian singer Dalal Abu Amna was detained for two days, then placed under house arrest, her lawyer says, after posting a Palestinian flag emoji and the Muslim phrase, there is no victor but God. She later took it down, but says in a new post, they tried to strip me of my humanity, silence my voice, and humiliate me in every way. Since the war started, Israel's police says they've investigated 110 cases of incitement on social media and arrested 90 people. At least 17 have already been indicted. Most, if not all, are believed to be Arabs, although the police haven't said. Israel police telling NBC News, these acts of incitement present a significant threat to the stability of public order and the overall tranquility within our communities. In a nation of nearly 10 million people, roughly 2 million are Arab, about a fifth of the population. In many mixed cities in Israel, there are mosques right next to synagogues. Some Arabs who are also Israeli citizens say they feel caught between conflicting identities. Back in Ramla, Yusuf El Shamali is at the bustling shuk, or market, buying vegetables from Moshe, who he's known for 30 years. He tells me what you see in the media, Jews and Arabs always at odds, isn't what you see in the market. Here's a Jew. Here's a Jew. I'm an Arab. They're Arabs. Yusuf says, here in a mixed city, we're family. The problem, you see, is government. Josh, that's a fascinating report. But you know, incitement for violence is in the eye of the beholder, and there's a fine line between free speech and incitement to violence, right? That's absolutely right, Tom. This is a gray area, and that really is the problem here. Israel does have laws that protect free speech, but there are exceptions for national security, for things like inciting violence or supporting terror groups, of which Israel considers Hamas to be a terror group. But this is in the eye of the beholder. So, for example, if you voice support online for uh, people who are living in Hamas-run Gaza Strip, uh, does that constitute support for Hamas? Some of these people who have been arrested say that they simply posted verses from the Quran that were interpreted by uh, Israel's authorities as somehow support for violence against the Israeli state. And so that is a key challenge here. But some of these students, we should point out, have successfully challenged the disciplinary proceedings from their universities, Tom. Josh, good report. Thank you very much. Still to come from us, a tentative deal that could lead to the end of the auto workers' strike weeks after they walked off the job. What's in the agreement and what's still at stake? That's coming up next. you did you do a lot of spending over the summer a lot of americans did and did rather a spending spree and that pushed gdp growth well beyond expectations uh, in fact 4.9 percent economic growth that's a strong market and a strong jobs market slowing inflation helped consumers feel more comfortable about going out and spending money on goods and services despite high interest rates and inflation but this strong economic growth is not expected to continue NBC's Brian Chung is joining me now to geek out on the numbers. Brian, I, I got to say, this is just as mind boggling to me. 4.9% economic growth. This economy is just continuing to move at a uh, freight train pace or, or a speed train pace, right? Given all the fears of the recession so far, it's not happening.
Yeah, well, I mean, let's just call it what it is. This was a gangbusters report. This was well above what economists had expected. 4.9% GDP growth, by the way. Again, GDP, a proxy for economic growth. That was the fastest pace that we've seen since 2021. You would have to go back to the reopening of the economy for 2020 to really see anything larger than that. So what we're talking about here and the drivers behind that growth in the third quarter, it was consumer spending. It was things on your essentials like housing, like health care, and also prescription drugs. But it was also also non-essential things like food and drink and also recreational goods and vehicles. So these are all pointing to an economy that continues to roar despite those recessionary fears, Tom. All right. But, Brian, uh, you know, economists have predicted 10 of the last two recessions. What should we expect as we go forward now going into the holiday season? Will Americans keep spending money? Yeah, and this is a factor where you have some economists worried that we could start to see the slowdown in the fourth quarter of this year, and there are a few reasons for that. Yes, it is indeed the time for holiday spending, but you have to remember we have student loan repayments having begun October 1st. We also have some concerns about higher borrowing costs bleeding through the economy. The Federal Reserve had been hiking interest rates. They've been on pause as of late, but we've seen bond yield spike. Could that bleed into higher borrowing costs for businesses where they start to pull back? Because that's a big part of economic growth as well. Either way, there are some pluses to that fourth quarter. Again, there's a lot of spending for the holidays. There's also a lot of travel. So if people go out and they still travel mm -hmm. to go for, out for the holidays, especially maybe if they're flying United with that window seat, maybe that's going to be a factor that can actually keep economic growth buoyed in the next quarter. Yeah, and the airlines say things are looking good for them. Uh, Brian, thank you very much. Brian Chung. Uh, we have a possible breakthrough in the nearly six weeks old strike against Detroit automakers with the United Auto Workers Union saying it has reached a tentative contract agreement with Ford. The deal includes a roughly 25% pay increase over four years, cost of living wage adjustments, major gains on pensions and job security, and the right to strike over plant closures. But one employee tells NBC News 25% that's just not enough. Take a listen. I'm not loving that at all. It seems like a lot of people are excited about it, but it seemed like we was out here long enough in the rain and cold weather, and it was some good days along with some bad days, but at the same time, what we were shooting for was at least 30 to 35 percent. Well, that four-year deal still has to be approved by the union members, but it could pave the way for other deals with General Motors and Stellantis, which owns Jeep Chrysler. NBC Shaquille Brewster is joining us now. Shaq, this is a, a tentative deal that still needs to be approved. What is the process now, and how likely is it that union members will sign off on the deal? Well, that part remains to be seen, but if you listen to the UAW president and the vice president when they announced this agreement yesterday, it seems as if they're going to be encouraging their membership to uh, pass this and to vote to ratify this agreement. They used words like historic. They said there were record deals. You went through the details of the deal, and we'll learn a little bit more in the days to come, but what's the process here now? Well, we know this weekend UAW leadership will meet in Detroit. That's the step two that you're looking at in that ratification process from the UAW. They'll vote on whether or not this goes to the membership at large. There'll be a series of meetings, including meetings at individual local chapters where they explain the specifics in this agreement and what exactly has been won. The UAW has said what we've seen and what's been announced is only a hint, are only the highlights of this agreement. And then eventually the entire union membership will have a vote on this and they will vote this up or down. But until that process happens or as that process plays out, you see behind me there are no more picketers. Uh, outside of Ford plants, uh, workers have been called back to the plant. And just a hint of how long it takes for that process to happen, although workers are going to be going back, it's going to take some time for, before those bottlenecks go away. It's going to take about a week, uh, some workers have been telling us, for them, for this assembly line to fully go back online to how it was before the strike. All right, real quickly, Shaq, bring us up to date on the negotiations with GM and Stellantis. Will this put pressure on them? This is likely to put pressure on them. That is usually the pattern with these strikes. We did hear, hear from both of those automakers. They essentially said that they are still at the negotiating table. If you look at the statement from GM, for example, they said we're working constructively with the UAW to reach a tentative agreement as soon as possible. Solantis almost mirroring those words, saying that they're working towards an agreement that gets everyone back to work as soon as possible. Uh, those conversations will remain and will be ongoing, and the union leadership has been very clear that they're hoping this agreement with Ford 
puts pressure on the other two big automakers to also make concessions and also come up and find that tentative agreement. Tom? And you'll be watching Shaq Brewster on the story. Thank you, sir. That's a wrap for us at this hour. A reminder to catch Callie Jackson's now special report, the Breakdown Israel-Hamas War Report. Trying to get answers now on some of the biggest questions coming out of the Middle East. Tomorrow night at 11 p.m. Eastern, coverage for us resumes right now. This is the top of the hour, and good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson. Right now, this massive manhunt underway for the suspect accused of killing 18 people in the small town in Maine of Lewiston. As we await a press conference set to start any minute from officials there, it all began just before 7 p.m. last night, forcing people to run in terror from the scene last night as the shooting unfolded, desperate to get away from the gunfire. Locals there, just about to start this news conference. We want to bring you that right now, live. Good evening. I'm Carl Schleen, mayor of Lewiston. In the wake of the tragic and horrifying incident that occurred in Lewiston, our hearts are heavy with grief, and we extend our deepest sympathies to the victims and their families. This is a time for action, solidarity, and support. Please take note, the shelter-in-place order issued by the Lewiston Police Department remains in effect. Please stay at home and be safe. The city of Lewiston is grateful for the support and outpouring from state authorities, the community, and of course, our elected officials. Speaking tonight will be U.S. Senator Susan Collins, U.S. Representative Jared Golden, and Steve Littleson, President and CEO of Central Maine Medical Center. And now Senator Collins. Thank you, Mayor. Today is a dark day for the state of Maine. As the mayor said, our hearts are heavy with grief. This heinous attack, which has robbed the lives of at least 18 Mainers and injured so many more, is the worst mass shooting that the state of Maine has ever experienced and could ever imagine. Today, I looked out my window in Washington and I saw that the flags had been lowered. And I realized that it had been done to honor the victims of this horrific attack. I'm grateful for the leadership of Lewiston Police Chief St. Pierre and for the bravery of the hundreds of state, local, and federal law enforcement officers who are leading the search for the killer. I'm also very grateful for all of the hospital employees who came back to work to take care of the victims and for our first responders whose bravery was so evident. Last night, the president called me. He stepped out of the state dinner with the Australian prime minister to offer any help that the federal government could provide the city of Lewiston, Androscoggin County, and the state of Maine. I also, at midnight, talked to Governor Mills, who has been a pillar of strength for our state. Tom Perez, who is a special advisor to the president throughout the night, texted me back and forth, what you need? And I would tell him based on conversations that I had as he coordinated the federal response. This morning, Secretary of Homeland Security Mayork has called and offered help from his department. The Attorney General also called, along with Maine's own U.S. Attorney, to offer their help. Right before I came into this 
building, I had a call from the deputy director of the FBI, who told me that there are 80 FBI agents on site participating in the search for the killer. 80. That doesn't include other people from the marshal's office, from the ATF, the DEA, and the Department of Homeland Security, and the Coast Guard. This has been a concerted effort at the state, local, and federal level. And everyone is determined to bring the killer to justice. To the families of those who have been injured or killed, I know that no words can fully ease the shock, the pain, and the justifiable anger that you are feeling. My hope is that you will feel the solace and strength in knowing that you are in the hearts of the people of Maine and of people throughout our nation. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce the Congressman Jared Golden, who represents this area of Maine. Thank you, Senator. Thank you to Mayor Shaleen as well. My name is Congressman Jared Golden from the town of Lewiston, I represent Maine's 2nd Congressional District. Some of you might not recognize me because Congress has been so crazy lately. I haven't gotten a haircut in months. So sometimes things happen that bring your worst nightmares to life. Yesterday, this is what happened in Lewiston. At a time like this, a leader is forced to grapple with things that are far greater than his or herself. Humility is called for as accountability is sought by the victims of a tragedy such as this one. Out of fear of this dangerous world that we live in and my determination to protect my own daughter and wife in our home and in our community, because of a false confidence that our community was above this and that we could be in full control among many other misjudgments, I have opposed efforts to ban deadly weapons of war like the assault rifle we used to carry out this crime. The time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing in my hometown of Lewiston, Maine. For the good of my community, I will work with any colleague to get this done in the time that I have left in Congress. To the people of Lewiston, my constituents throughout the second district, to the families who lost loved ones, and to those who have been harmed, I ask for forgiveness and support as I seek to put an end to these terrible shootings. In the days to come, I will give everything I have to support this community's recovery. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce uh, Steve Littleson, President and CEO of Central Maine Medical Center. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Littleson, the CEO of Central Maine Healthcare, uh, which includes Central Maine Medical Center here in Lewiston. Uh, on behalf of the 3,000 professionals and team members of Central Maine Healthcare, I too would like to extend our deepest condolences uh, to the families of the victims of the events of last night. I would also like to acknowledge the compassion and the expertise and the teamwork displayed by the healthcare professionals in this community last night when called upon under the most extreme circumstances. Just to give you uh, the numbers as we have them now, I know there's been some confusion and I would like to take the opportunity to just let you know what we dealt with and what we have currently uh, in our hospital. Uh, all but one of the patients uh, that were taken from the scenes last night were brought to Central Maine Medical Center. One was transported directly to St. Mary's Medical Center here in Lewiston. Of those patients, two were treated and discharged. One of those patients was transferred from Central Maine Medical Center to Maine Medical Center in Portland. Three patients, unfortunately, passed away in St. Uh, Central Maine Medical Center uh, last night. 
Of those, eight remain now, and we have five patients who are in stable condition, three who are in critical condition in our critical care unit. Just to give you a sense of the scope of what we dealt with within a relatively short period of time, last night within about 45 minutes to an hour, we had six fully staffed and running operating rooms at Central Maine Medical Center caring for the wounded and the victims. The professionals that were operating simultaneously in those six operating rooms included orthopedic surgeons, general trauma surgeons, urologists, vascular surgeons, as well as anesthesiologists and support personnel. I would like to also express our appreciation for all of the support that we received and continue to receive uh, even through today. Uh, first from the city of Lewiston, uh, secondly from law enforcement. We still have a law enforcement presence on the campus at Central Maine Medical Center. The other area hospitals uh, that came to our support uh, we needed blood transferred uh, to Central Maine Medical Center very quickly, uh, and two of the hospitals, Maine General and St. Mary's, accommodated us. Maine Med uh, in Portland stood by uh, and was um, ready to accept patients, and as you know, uh, they did uh, accept one of the patients that we transferred uh, to them. And also the various community partners that came to uh, aid and uh, support us last night, including uh, emergency uh, response personnel, personnel from Life Flight of Maine, and others. As one of the counselors said to me before we walked in tonight, you know, often people underestimate our capabilities here to care for people locally. I think last night we proved that by working together, we can do just that under the most trying circumstances. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Uh, Senator, you just heard from Representative Jerry Goldman that he has changed his mind on an assault rifle ban. Would you do the same? Well, first of all, let me say that I think it is more important that we ban very high capacity magazines. I think that would have more input and more um, effectiveness. We had an assault weapon ban, which I supported, uh, that was in effect for 10 years. It applied to, I believe, 17 or 19 styles of weapons. Uh, later, the late uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein proposed an expansion that would have covered 157 weapons, and it was based not on functionality, but on cosmetic features. So there's always more that we can do. I was a co-author of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, uh, which provided funding, for example, for uh, red and yellow flag laws. And, um, and for mental health clinics, which I think is important as well. So certainly there's, there's always more that can be done. Senator, a decade ago, though, you opposed legislation that limited access to uh, expanded you know, stocks and firearms uh, capacity. Are you, are you suggesting that you would do something different now? I don't believe you're correct. For example, I was the lead Republican sponsor of a bill that would ban bump stocks, which have the ability to turn a semi-automatic into a fully automatic machine gun. And um, that legislation has not been enacted into law. There was an attempt to do it by, let, by regulation, but it was struck down by the courts. I still support the uh, bump stock legislation. The other thing that I think we can look at is, and I advocated, um, was to increase the age at which you could purchase 
um, a high capacity rifle from 18 to 21, the way it is for a handgun. Senator Collins, you mentioned um, there are a lot of questions about the whereabouts of Robert Carr. You mentioned a number of agencies searching for him. Can you offer any more details regarding the whereabouts of Carr or how close we're getting to finding him? I cannot because I don't want to jeopardize the search for him in any way. I have talked extensively uh, to law enforcement and, as I said, just very recently with the FBI deputy director, um, but I certainly don't want to jeopardize the search in any way. You are a big advocate of them. Do you know if they were used in this case? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Yellow flag laws used in this case? To my, I, I don't know. That's a very That's good a question. Main got it right when it came to yellow flag Maine does, does have a good flag. yellow flag. If it's true, as we are hearing, that Robert Carr had mental health issues and he was, um, the police put him forward for evaluation, you got it wrong. No, that I don't know whether there was a report to trigger the yellow flag law. There, it's certainly on the face of the facts that we have. It seems. Could you could you let me finish, please? Um, it certainly seems that on the basis of the facts that we have, that the yellow flag law should have been triggered if, in fact, um, the suspect was hospitalized for two weeks for mental illness. That should have triggered uh, the yellow flag law, and he should have been separated from his weapons. I'm sure after the fact that's going to be um, looked at very closely. Obviously, that's a state issue, and I do not have knowledge of what happened in that instance. Senator Collins, uh, Mark Stone from Sky News, thank you for your time. I, I wonder if I could just ask you about the weapons again. Why do you think it is that you and so many other lawmakers in America believe it is right for Americans to have the right to own such high-velocity weapons? Well, first of all, let me say, um, and I'll repeat it again, uh, that for 10 years we had a ban on certain kinds of assault weapons, and I supported that ban. And when George W. Bush proposed that it be extended for 10 more years, I supported that effort, which did not succeed. Later, um, years later, there was an attempt by former Senator Dianne Feinstein to greatly expand the number of weapons that would be covered by that ban. And it was based not on lethality, but more on how they looked, on cosmetic features. And I did not think that that was appropriate. We do have a Second Amendment in our country. And that gives and, people the right to own a weapon that powerful, you think? And Maine, I would point out, has one of the highest rates of gun ownership in the country and has a long heritage of responsible gun ownership. It has also had a very low rate of violence. What makes this crime so heinous is in a typical year, Maine might have 22 murders. And last night, we almost approached the number for the entire year. Is anyone here agree with the investigation to tell us? Can I have a conversation now? Thank you so much. I appreciate your patience with us and this next conference. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, we've been listening to that news conference there in Maine, and as you've seen, elected officials coming under very heated and pointed questions from the press, including uh, a lot of foreign uh, reporters asking about America's gun culture and the laws that apparently failed 
to prevent this man, who was known to have been hospitalized for two weeks with a mental health condition and known to be a gun enthusiast, and admitted that he had, in fact, had dreams or nightmares of engaging in a mass murder, failed to take guns away from him uh, and failed to act to prevent this kind of a mass murder. You saw there Susan Collins on the defensive talking about whether the state's yellow flag laws uh, were even put in place and were used during this mass shooting. And then a remarkable conversation and comment from the Democratic representative, Representative Jaron Golden, who came forth and asked for the state's forgiveness, apologizing that he had opposed uh, trying to ban assault weapons in Maine, saying that it was a, a horrible decision he had uh, participated in in the, in the past, and that, in fact, he would now do all he can to ban assault weapons, semi-automatic weapons there uh, in Maine. Let's go quickly now to NBC's Rahema Ellis, who is on the ground. And, Rahema, we also have some other breaking news. Police now say that they did, in fact, find the murder weapon in that white Subaru uh, that they recovered last night. That doesn't mean it's the only weapon that the suspect has, and he's still at large. Yes, indeed. Uh, whether that leads them closer to this suspect or not, we don't know. Again, I can't emphasize how much people here are hoping that every single bit of evidence that they may glean from this suspect's whereabouts, et cetera, will lead them closer to him. You know, we talked about earlier the fact that they, uh, according to law enforcement, they say that he has several acres of property here in uh, Maine. They also tell us that they found a note in his home. What, where the note was found, what the note says, how long the, the note is, the details, they have not revealed that either. They are trying to keep most of this information, it seems, very close to the vest in an effort not to reveal anything, to tip their hand that these clues may lead to further being the suspect being evasive from authorities. Uh, Susan Collins, uh, Senator Susan Collins even mentioned that herself when she talked about the fact that she didn't have more information about how the search for the suspect was going. But you're right, she was questioned a lot about what her uh, belief and what her stand is on these types of assault West weapons from a foreign reporter. And she talked about how Maine is one of the, the states in the country with one of the highest gun ownerships in the country. But as she said, it also has one of the lowest gun violence rates in the country. We do know that in all of last year, there were about 29 murders, homicides in the state of Maine last year. And then there were 18 and just one night last night. That's a powerful impact that that's having on this community. What that will do in terms of changing the way people think about gun laws, that's yet to be seen. But as you yeah. point out, the congressman from this area, he said he's rethinking the way he was approaching this subject before and apologizing to the people of Maine. I have never before heard a member of Congress come out and ask for the state's apology and, uh, and uh, forgiveness, rather, and the forgiveness of the people in that area uh, for forever supporting uh, semi-automatic weapons. Uh, that was a remarkable moment. Yeah, I, I do think it's worth mentioning here that we heard a lot of, of British accents there. Uh, and w anybody who's ever spent time overseas knows you immediately get an earful from especially Europeans. They don't understand America's gun culture. So as it relates to why were they speaking up, that's usually why. They really don't understand it, especially uh, in the U.K. Talk about, if you will, the massive law enforcement response. We've got local, state, federal law enforcement on, on the ground. How big of an operation is this in a very wooded and remote area? It is massive. They've got hundreds of law enforcement folks out, as you point out, local, state, and, and federal. We understand that the Coast Guard also has some assets deployed. ATF, the Boston branch agents, are responding. Also, the FBI agents are on the ground here in Maine, and U.S. Marshals are also taking part in this manhunt. They are fanned out all across this community, not just in Lewiston, but in this county, but in neighboring counties. And in fact, Tom, you're aware that it was earlier this evening that they issued a stay at home shelter in place alert. They expanded it to a neighboring community. Again, it's about doing all they can to make certain people stay home and stay safe. Tom? 40 year old Robert Card still missing at this hour, believed armed and dangerous. Rahema, thank you very much. We'll be right back. More coverage on NBC News Now.
We're back now over to the Middle East, where hours ago the Israeli military car carried out a rare targeted ground raid into northern Gaza. Take a look here. The IDF putting out this video of tanks and special forces actually inside Gaza, and before then pulling back from the area. Israel says the operation is part of a, quote, preparation for the next stage of combat in what could be a precursor to the widely expected ground invasion into Gaza. The big question remains right now, what will that look like and when could it happen? And it comes as we're just now learning the U.S. is, the U.S. is deploying 900 troops to the Middle East amid all of the tension. And of course, the number of people rising, uh, killed rather, continues to rise. Uh, and at least 7,000 people are dead in Gaza right now. That according to the Palestinian Health Authority. NBC's Hala Gorani is on the ground in Tel Aviv. Uh, this is a situation that changes by the hour. Give us a sense now of what the military there is doing. It's already had a raid into Gaza. And is there another one underway right now? And what's the sense on the ground of when the big raid may happen? That's an open question still. The uh, raid that occurred yesterday overnight, and you uh, showed some of those night scope uh, images uh, to our viewers there, was limited, but it was the biggest one yet. About half a mile into the Gaza Strip with tanks. The aim of that one was to identify Hamas targets, but also to target uh, these uh, anti-tank missile launch uh, pads that uh, Hamas uses against some of the armored uh, vehicles that uh, presumably the Israeli military will be using in its ground offensive. But this l large ground assault, um, really we don't know uh, about the timing. The Israeli government, the prime minister, the defense minister, all promising a large-scale ground offensive. We don't know when it will happen. We don't know how long it will last. We don't know how deeply into the territory they will go. Uh, these are all open questions. Even when the prime minister of this country gave a primetime address, he gave very few details about what to expect on that front. But this is all happening against the backdrop of a, a really deteriorating humanitarian situation. Mm -hmm. Aid agencies are saying they need fuel. They're getting a few trucks in every day but no fuel so that they cannot operate the vehicles to get the essential supplies to the people who need it inside of the Gaza Strip. Tom. Hala, you are a veteran of reporting there, and I'm wondering what your, what your own read is on this. Uh, is Israel waiting because it needs to further prepare? Is it waiting because of international pressure? Is it waiting because of a potential humanitarian disaster, which is only going to grow worse uh, in Gaza? Uh, is it waiting because it's afraid mm -hmm. that its own troops are going to be uh, slaughtered as they go into Gaza? I mean, there's an awful lot really riding on this. I think it's all of the above, actually. I think you summarized it pretty well. There is a lot of pressure being put on this government that in the early days uh, uh, after October 7th really was in such a state of shock at the scale of the attack that they promised a full-scale ground, ground offensive. We were hearing terminology like, you know, we will eradicate Hamas, we will change the Middle East forever. I think as time has gone by and the implications of a full-scale ground assault of what urban warfare means for Israeli troops on the ground, and also the pressure being put on this government from the likes of President Biden, among others, is giving them... Um, some reasons to pause, perhaps. And uh, there is also the, uh, pr the pressure coming from ordinary Israelis who have family members who are still held hostage inside of the Gaza Strip. They've mm -hmm. de demonstrated here in Tel Aviv in front of the Ministry of Defense, saying the uh, retrieval of the hostages should be number one. Everything else should come second. Tom? Hala, we are very grateful to have you on the ground there. Thank you very much. Hala Garani in Tel Aviv. Uh, today, we are also getting our first look at the destruction caused by that record-setting Category 5 hurricane that slammed the popular Mexico resort town of Acapulco, seemingly out of nowhere. We're learning tonight that the storm killed at least 27 people. Take a look here. The streets underwater there and dramatically a stadium Right there, just absolutely surrounded by water on all sides. Entire floors of one building blown out by the water and the wind from that Cat 5. The town is literally upside down. Tonight, people say they are shocked by how quickly this all happened, and they're surprised that they survived.
What is this? What is this? We are alive. I don't know how we are alive, but we are alive. The hurricane came on shore very early Wednesday morning after experts say it just explosively intensified, catching everybody off guard. It is the strongest storm to hit Mexico's Pacific coast ever. Let's bring in NBC's Guad Venegas watching all of this. Guad, uh, give us an update now. A lot of people care about Acapulco, friends and family there. What's the latest on their efforts to try to get things picked up and restore communication? Well, Acapulco is an area on the coast in the state of Guerrero, Tom, that only has one main road that connects it to the rest of the country that goes through the capital of the state and then to Mexico City. That road needed a lot of work. There were landslides and other issues with that road. So authorities began working on clearing at least two lanes, one to get to Acapulco, one to get out of Acapulco. So now the resources are coming in to help. And you can see these images with the debris all across town. A lot of these videos that are coming out like this one are from the hotel area. This is the downtown area where the luxury hotels are located. There's even more damage in the outskirts and the small towns and neighborhoods with very, very vulnerable uh, avid, uh, people that live in Acapulco. Now, this city has more than 600,000 uh, people that live there, plus the tourists that were either visiting from other countries or from different parts of Mexico, Tom. So there's also an effort to get a lot of those tourists evacuated. They're using buses because the airport also suffered damage, damage to the terminal and damage to the control tower, according to the president. So they're using buses to get everyone they can who doesn't live in Acapulco to Mexico City while authorities are still assessing the damage. The report that came out earlier today indicating that 27 people died, four people were missing. Those were four soldiers. Uh, first responders uh, that authorities say one of them uh, is believed to be among those that died. So again, these reports are still coming in as they assess that damage. Claude, thank you very much. Keep us updated. Happening late today, Sam Bankman Freed appeared before a judge ahead of his expected testimony in his own defense tomorrow. This was a very rare move. The judge decided to hold a hearing with Bankman Freed first without the jury. The judge will then decide what evidence the jury can hear. Now, SBF told the jury less courtroom that his crypto company, FTX, was subject to constant hacking attacks and the lawyers for the company were in charge of moving money between companies associated with FTX, opening bank accounts for customers, and they decided when they could delete company data. CMC's Kate Rooney watching the trial for us. Kate, thanks for joining us. This one's odd, isn't it? This uh, all the developments today. And you told me an hour ago you weren't so sure that uh, he actually was competent at the end of that appearance before the judge. Yeah, Tom, that was my takeaway. It was such a difference from when he was being questioned by his own defense team. His lawyers got up, asked him questions that seemed he seemed prepared for. They were predictable. He seemed confident, was answering clearly completely different picture when the prosecution, the government side, got up there. He was really obfuscating the topics, trying to kind of delay. He would take a sip of water to try to buy himself some time, was stalling. The judge didn't like that. He said to Bankman Freed a couple of times, answer the question directly. He kind of sarcastically said that the defendant has an interesting way of answering questions. Didn't bode well with the judge. As you mentioned in the intro, the jury wasn't in the room today, but we do expect the jury to be back tomorrow. You'll hear more cross-examination. And this was sort of a preview, a little bit of a curtain raiser on what the jury could see. Bankman Freed was a little bit rattled by the questions that he didn't expect. And they tried to poke holes in his testimony by showing him certain documents that seemed to conflict with, with uh, what he had told his own defense team. So an interesting view into sort of the psychology of some of this testimony. And as you mentioned, a high risk situation here to put him on the stand in the first place. All right, so let's double down on that. If, he, if, his, if his competence started to look shaky and he didn't have a jury, and now he's gonna be cross-examined by, cross by the prosecution, uh, what kind of holes are they going to continue to poke into his story? And it doesn't always work out well it, for somebody in a white collar uh, criminal case to take his own to take the stand on his own behalf. Yeah, absolutely. They'll try to poke holes in the, his criminal intent. His defense team has tried to say he didn't intend to defraud anyone. There may have been crimes committed, but he didn't know he was doing this. He had good intent. So that's what the defense is going to say. Prosecution is going to try to prove the opposite there. But one of the risks here is that the judge comes down on him on sentencing. If the judge says or believes that he lied under oath, that could be a big deal when, if and when he is found guilty. 
and could add years to his sentence, potentially. CNBC's Kate Rooney, thank you very much. We want to get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, that week-long manhunt for a man accused of shooting and killing a judge in Maryland. It ended today with the suspect found dead. Just hours before the judge was killed, he had ruled against Pedro Argote in a child custody fight with Argote's uh, estranged wife. Police say they found Argote's body in a heavily wooded area today. They're still investigating how he died. Number two, the FDA warning people about how deadly it is or how deadly giving babies probiotics can really be. It says at least one baby's death was linked to probiotics. The FDA now looking into more cases like this. Its concern is that probiotics are being illegally sold to hospitals to treat diseases in preterm infants. Number three, New York Congressman Jamal Bowman pleaded guilty today to pulling a fire alarm in the Capitol building when there was no fire. It happened when lawmakers were scrambling, scrambling rather, to pass a funding bill before government shut down. Bowman has to pay a $1,000 fine and write a letter of apology to the U.S. Capitol Police Chief. Number four, Taco Bell winning its fight to, quote, liberate the phrase Taco Tuesday after a New Jersey restaurant that trademarked the term decided to part ways with the term. Taco Bell has spent months in this legal battle. And it says now that everybody can have the opportunity to go celebrate Taco Tuesday. And number five, take a look at this. People at this Wisconsin restaurant did not get what they ordered when this deer came crashing through a window during lunchtime. Nobody heard. The restaurant is now offering, sorry for the pun, a two-buck mac and cheese special on Wednesday to, to commemorate the incident. Our floor director here is in the giggles. When we come back, the suspect in the Idaho College murders back in court today and his push to have the case thrown out just failed. What's next in this trial after the break? Just after bottom of the hour and just a little while ago, an Idaho judge denied a motion to dismiss the case for the suspect who is charged on the murder of four University of Idaho students. It came at the end of that suspect's second hearing of the day. His lawyers tried two different arguments to try to get the case tossed. Number, remember, rather, that Brian Koberger was indicted by a grand jury in May for the murder of four University of Idaho students. He pleaded not guilty. They were found dead in their off-campus home last November. All right, we want to remind you of their names and their faces as we bring in NBC's Dana Griffin, who is covering the latest development. Dana, uh, the motion to dismiss denied. The first hearing was closed and sealed, so we don't know much about those arguments. But the second hearing, yeah. uh, what was the deciding factor in that hearing? So, Tom, during that 40-minute hearing to dismiss the grand jury indictment, the defense argued that the jury was misled during jury instructions earlier this year on the standard of proof required for an indictment. The defense says the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt and had more evidence been provided when asked by several jurors, they might have reached a different conclusion. Now, the state argued that probable cause is the correct standard of proof for a grand jury. The judge ultimately denied the motion, saying that the argument is something the Idaho Supreme Court needs to weigh in on. And legal experts say that this attempt by the defense to get the grand jury indictment thrown out is fairly routine and, as proven this afternoon, is rarely achieved by a defense team. Now, keep in mind, prosecutors in the University of Idaho murders case have laid out sufficient evidence for this case to go to trial, including finding Kohlberger's DNA on a knife sheath found next to one of the victims inside that murder home. Tom? All right, Dana, thank you very much. NBC covers hundreds of international stories each day. And because it is awfully difficult to stay on top of everything, to watch, read, listen to everything, our international teams have done it for you and for me. So here are some of the things they are keeping an eye on. We call the segment The Global. From Germany, prosecutors say an American man is charged with murder and other offenses after allegedly pushing two women into a ravine killing one of them. The attack happened, happened in June, you may recall, near a castle popular with tourists. Murder charges in Germany have a maximum of life sentence. Out of China, the country's youngest ever space crew lifted off today, headed for its own space station, China's space station. The average age of the three-member crew, just 38. China says it is planning to put astronauts on the moon. By the end of the decade, the U.S. wants to go back 
by about 2025. From Iraq and Syria, take a look at these declassified American Cold War era spy images, part of a new study from the archaeological journal Antiquity, revealing hundreds of long lost Roman forts from the empire's eastern frontier. Historians assume the stru structures were a defense line, but these forts are showing a different picture. Researchers say they once supported the movement of goods and people across the entire region. Coming up, the U.S. economy is doing much better than expected. Can you say on fire? Experts say it's not expected to last, and it is going to impact, already is impacting the housing market. Plus, why some Arab citizens who live in Israel say they're scared to post their feelings online. That's coming up in the original. Quarter till the hour, we want to bring you now today's original, which is in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And you're probably seeing tons of posts on social media about the Israel-Hamas war from people in the U.S. and around the world. But some Arab citizens of Israel, Arab citizens of Israel, who make up about 20 percent of the population there, they say that they're scared to post because it can have a major blowback effect. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. The Israeli city of Ramla, Arabs and Jews have been living, working, and raising families on the same land for centuries. Yusuf El Shamli, a grandfather and one of Israel's Arab citizens, says his family has been here for 80 years. But these days, Yusuf fears if he says one word about the suffering of Arabs in Gaza, the Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, will arrest him. I ask him how it feels to be an Arab in Israel during a war. He says, we Arabs in Israel are like a divorced couple. The kids don't know where to go, to mom or to dad. We're in the middle. Since the Israel-Gaza war started, human rights groups say hundreds of Arabs have been fired, suspended from universities, or even arrested, accused of supporting terror or sympathizing with Hamas, mostly on social media. Israel's police chief has declared zero tolerance for inciting violence and pro-Hamas protests, saying on TikTok, anyone who wants to identify with Gaza, go ahead. I'll put them on buses and send them there. And the president of Tel Aviv University has vowed to be very strict with students who support Hamas writing, when we feel the offense is criminal in nature, we shall report them to the police. Hassan Jabarin runs Adala, an Arab human rights group representing 80 students who have been suspended or expelled. We are trying to explain that this people have the right of freedom of expression to express their anger against the war and to criticize Israel, but has nothing to do with supporting violence against Israelis. Amir, not his real name, was threatened with disciplinary proceedings after a social media post suggesting the historical oppression of Palestinians had led to the Israel-Gaza war. And what was the response to that post? Well, uh, the response was people accusing me of justifying terrorism. The university has sent me an email basically saying that they have reason to believe that I am supporting the actions of a certain side over there. The side of Hamas, whose terror attacks killed more than 1,400 people and triggered an Israeli response that many Arab citizens say includes an unprecedented crackdown on free speech. Amir, who says he opposes violence against civilians, requested anonymity because he says he's concerned about even more retaliation for speaking out about what happened. How risky is it for you to be speaking out right now? I mean, everyone is terrified. Other Arab students have reported being doxxed, their home addresses posted on social media. <laughs> and popular Palestinian singer Dalal Abu Amna was detained for two days, then placed under house arrest, her lawyer says, after posting a Palestinian flag emoji and the Muslim phrase, there is no victor but God. She later took it down, but says in a new post, they tried to strip me of my humanity, silence my voice, and humiliate me in every way. Since the war started, Israel's police says they've investigated 110 cases of incitement on social media and arrested 90 people. At least 17 have already been indicted. Most, if not all, are believed to be Arabs, although the police haven't said. Israel police telling NBC News these acts of incitement present a significant threat to the stability of public order and the overall tranquility within our communities. In a nation of nearly 10 million people, roughly 2 million are Arab, about a fifth of the population. 
In many mixed cities in Israel, there are mosques right next to synagogues. Some Arabs who are also Israeli citizens say they feel caught between conflicting identities. Back in Ramla, Yusuf El Shamali is at the bustling shuk or market, buying vegetables from Moshe, who he's known for 30 years. He tells me what you see in the media, Jews and Arabs always at odds, isn't what you see in the market. Here's a Jew. Here's a Jew. I'm an Arab. They're Arabs. Yusuf says, here in a mixed city, we're family. The problem, you see, is government. Josh, that's a fascinating report, but you know incitement for violence is in the eye of the beholder, and there's a fine line between free speech and incitement to violence, right? That's absolutely right, Tom. This is a gray area, and that really is the problem here. Israel does have laws that protect free speech, but there are exceptions for national security, for things like inciting violence or supporting terror groups, of which Israel considers Hamas to be a terror group. But this is in the eye of the beholder. So, for example, if you voice support online for uh, people who are living in Hamas-run Gaza Strip, uh, does that constitute support for Hamas? Some of these people who have been arrested say that they simply posted verses from the Quran that were interpreted by uh, Israel's authorities as somehow support for violence against the Israeli state. And so that is a key challenge here. But some of these students, we should point out, have successfully challenged the disciplinary proceedings from their universities, Tom. Josh, good report. Thank you very much. Still to come from Moss, a tentative deal that could lead to the end of the auto worker strike weeks after they walked off the job. What's in the agreement and what's still at stake? That's coming up next. you did you do a lot of spending over the summer a lot of americans did and did rather a spending spree and that pushed gdp growth well beyond expectations uh, in fact 4.9 percent economic growth that's a strong market and a strong jobs market slowing inflation helped consumers feel more comfortable about going out and spending money on goods and services despite high interest rates and inflation but this strong economic growth is not expected to continue NBC's Brian Chung is joining me now to geek out on the numbers. Brian, I, I got to say, this is just as mind boggling to me. 4.9% economic growth. This economy is just continuing to move at a uh, freight train pace or, or a speed train pace, right? Given all the fears of the recession so far, it's not happening. Yeah, well, I mean, let's just call it what it is. This was a gangbusters report. This is well above what economists had expected. 4.9% GDP growth, by the way, again, GDP, a proxy for economic growth. That was the fastest pace that we've seen since 2021. You would have to go back to the reopening of the economy for 2020 to really see anything larger than that. So what we're talking about here and the drivers behind that growth in the third quarter, it was consumer spending. It was things on your essentials like housing, like health care, and also prescription drugs, but it was also also non-essential things like food and drink and also recreational goods and vehicles. So these are all pointing to an economy that continues to roar despite those recessionary fears, Tom. All right. But, Brian, uh, you know, economists have predicted 10 of the last two recessions. What should we expect as we go forward now going into the holiday season? Will Americans keep spending money? Yeah. And this is a factor where you have some economists worried that we could start to see the slowdown in the fourth quarter of this year. And there are a few reasons for that. Yes, it is indeed the time for holiday spending. But you have to remember, we have student loan repayments having begun October 1st. We also have some concerns about higher borrowing costs bleeding through the economy. The Federal Reserve had been hiking interest rates. They've been on pause as of late, but we've seen bond yield spike. Could that bleed into higher borrowing costs for businesses where they start to pull back? Because that's a big part of economic growth as well. Either way, there are some pluses to that fourth quarter. Again, there's a lot of spending for the holidays. There's also a lot of travel. So if people go out and they still travel mm -hmm. to go out for the holidays, especially maybe if they're flying United with that window seat, maybe that's going to be a factor that can actually keep economic growth buoyed in the next quarter. Yeah, and the airlines say things are looking good for them. Uh, Brian, thank you very much, Brian Chung. Uh, we have a possible breakthrough in the nearly six weeks old strike against Detroit automakers with the United Auto Workers Union saying it has reached a tentative contract agreement with Ford. The deal includes a roughly 25% pay increase over four years, cost of living wage adjustments, major gains on pensions and job security, and the right to strike over plant closures. But one employee tells NBC News 25% that's just not enough. Take a listen. 
I'm not loving that at all. It seemed like a lot of people are excited about it, but it seemed like we was out here long enough in the rain and cold weather, and it was some good days along with some bad days, but at the same time, what we were shooting for was at least 30 to 35 percent. Well, that four-year deal still has to be approved by the union members, but it could pave the way for other deals with General Motors and Stellantis, which owns Jeep Chrysler. NBC Shaquille Brewster is joining us now. Shaq, this is a, a tentative deal that still needs to be approved. What is the process now, and how likely is it that union members will sign off on the deal? Well, that part remains to be seen, but if you listen to the UAW president and the vice president when they announced this agreement yesterday, it seems as if they're going to be encouraging their membership to uh, pass this and to vote to ratify this agreement. They used words like historic. They said they're record deals. You went through the details of the deal, and we'll learn a little bit more in the days to come, but what's the process here now? Well, we know this weekend UAW leadership will meet in Detroit. That's the step two that you're looking at in that ratification process from the UAW. They'll vote on whether or not this goes to the membership at large. There'll be a series of meetings, including meetings at individual local chapters where they explain the specifics in this agreement and what exactly has been won. The UAW has said what we've seen and what's been announced is only a hint, are only the highlights of this agreement. And then eventually the entire union membership will have a vote on this and they will vote this up or down. But until until that process happens or as that process plays out, you see behind me there are no more picketers uh, outside of Ford plants. Uh, workers have been called back to the plant and just a hint of how long it takes for that process to happen. Although workers are going to be going back, it's going to take some time for, before those bottlenecks go away. It's going to take about a week, uh, some workers have been telling us, for them, for this assembly line to fully go back online to how it was before the strike. All right, real quickly, Shaq, bring us up to date on the negotiations with GM and Stellantis. Will this put pressure on them? This is likely to put pressure on them. That is usually the pattern with these strikes. We did hear, hear from both of those automakers. They essentially said that they are still at the negotiating table. If you look at the statement from GM, for example, they said we're working constructively with the UAW to reach a tentative agreement as soon as possible. Solantis almost mirroring those words, saying that they're working towards an agreement that gets everyone back to work as soon as possible. Uh, those conversations will remain and will be ongoing, and the union leadership has been very clear that they're hoping this agreement with Ford puts pressure on the other two big automakers to also make concessions and also come up and find that tentative agreement. Tom? And you'll be watching Shaq Brewster on the story. Thank you, sir. That's a wrap for us at this hour. A reminder to catch Callie Jackson's now special report, the Breakdown Israel-Hamas War Report. Trying to get answers now on some of the biggest questions coming out of the Middle East. Tomorrow night at 11 p.m. Eastern, coverage for us resumes right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.